all our centers. Uh, sometimes in Chennai. Uh, so, the president introduced Professor Balan Todd. He's a very distinguished novelist, and we all know much about him. So, he today talked to us about uh, super diffusivity and diffusivity of random walks in the random environment. Not only random environment, but random walks with long memory, two types. So, thank you very much for the invitation. It's an absolutely great pleasure to be back here in Bangalore. This is my third time in Bangalore and my fourth time in India altogether. And uh, needless to say, I enjoy it very much and I'm happy to be back here. So thanks. I will speak about, so my problem is the scaling limit, long time behavior scaling limit of random motions, random walks, diffusions, with long memory, where the long memory comes from, could come from various effects. So it's usually physically motivated. So either interaction with some background environment and memory is caused by, by going back to places you have seen before and, and picking up memory from the past. Or another type I, will be a type of random walk which pathwise interacts with its own past. So namely, for example, doesn't like to be, go back to places where it had been before. This is a sort of anti-reinforcement. That's I'm more interested in self-repellence than self-attraction, but, but this type of things I'm, I, I, I have in mind. So the walks, the types of walks, or diffusions, I will consider, first I, let, let me give you some very more concrete examples. One will be, I will speak of two big classes. One will be random walk in random environment of a particular kind, which I'm going to define now. I start with a probability space with a probability measure, this pi will be a probability measure on it. So this is a probability space, and assume that a space transi a, a translation, an action, a ZD action is also defined on that. So I have a family of shifts. These are tau sub Z, where Z is in ZD, and tau sub Z maps omega to omega in a measurable way, and assume that this is an ergodic an ergodic action. So it's ergodic, it's clear what I mean, that, that these, these, these act, this is a representation of ZD, so commute as you expect, so just shifts. And uh, ergodicity, we well understand. So I assume that, so this will be my environment, the space on which the environment, the random environment is defined. And let me assume that I have, yes, small notation, I just have to introduce notation. I don't by this script E, the nearest neighbor vector, so the possible jumps of my walk. So these are E and ZD such that I assume that my random walk will be, will be nearest neighbor only, right? And I still need some definitions. I have some maps, I call them lowercase v, I put here an E, E taken from there. These are maps from omega to say zero one, to minus one one. It could be any bound, but I take it from minus one one. These are uh, yes, and so these are just functions defined. And there is a major assumption I make here. The major assumption is that v e omega plus v minus e tau e omega equals zero. So this is a major assumption. This will impose some sort of divergence-free vector. This is like a divergence-free vector field on the lattice. You will see in a moment why. So let me assume just that, let, let me just say that I assume this. Right, so V, actually it would be enough to define half of these, only those pointing in, in the positive directions because by this relation, the, the, the ones pointing backwards is defined, right? And now I define my walk. My random walk will be continuous time because it's more convenient, but it could be discrete time as well. 
So my random walk, I put here an Amiga. So once, once I sampled the environment, I sampled the environment according to that distribution. Once the environment is sampled, my random walk in random environment will be a Markov, a Markovian jump process on ZD. Namely, and I tell you what, what the transition probabilities are. So the probability at, at t plus dt is at x plus e, conditioned that at t it was at x. Clear, yes? It's Markovian, so I, I told in plain words that once the environment is sampled, this will be a jump process nearest neighbor walk, which is a Markovian conditioned on, on the environment fixed. So this is equal to 1 plus VE tau x omega dt. Right? So in plain words, if my random walker, so this is the lattice, and this is the side x, so if my random walker is there, this is x plus e, then the jump rate, the rate of jump that way is, jump rate will be 1 plus v e tau x omega. Right? And this condition, which you see there, means that the jump rate backwards, the jump rate, so this is the, that jump rate, uh, the jump rate backwards is 1 plus v minus e tau x plus e omega. And as you see that these are the opposite of each other. So formally, what I wrote down was, is the following, that the probabilities of the rates, if you sum the rates of jumping outwards from this side, that sum will be equal to the rates of jumping inwards, right? So I just encoded this type of double stochasticity in this relation. Right? So it's a particular kind of random walk. It's a random walk in the environment with a particular constraint, namely that at each single site, the outwards rates equal, the sum of the outwards rate equals the sum of the inwards rates. Right? OK, it has a physical meaning. It's not just by chance I say that. It has a physical meaning which I will come back to. Right? And so this is my random walk in random environment. Let me. Let me make a remark which I will come back later to if I denote by eta t the process of the environment as seen by the random walker. So you travel with the random walker, the environment is encoded in, in, this, in omega, and as you travel around, then you see other and other shifted environments. So this is defined as tau x t omega. So that means just the environment as seen by the random walker. That's a standard thing we do in random walks in random environment, right? It's just, trust me, it is true, and it's a very simple, easy exercise to see. So this will be in omega, of course. This is a Markov process in omega on its own. It's a Markov process in omega. And from this condition, it follows that this Markov process is in omega is stationary in time. So this is stationary in time. So this is the environment process, not only stationary, but also ergodic. But if you want to find out what's the condition that the environment as seen by the random walker be stationary in time, this is slightly a slightly special example I will not speak about everything in most generality because it needs much more notation than and, and, and I just want to concentrate on what is essential. So essentially these are this is essentially this condition is the same as, as assuming that the, the environment seen by the random walker is stationary in time as a Markov process. Let me also write down the, the conditional drift. So E omega dxt conditioned on x t equals x, it's easy to see. So if these are your jump rates, then the conditional velocity or 
expectation of your next jump will be the sum over e times this. But this part will cancel out because e and minus e will cancel out. So you will be left with you will be left with sum over e e times v sub e of tau x omega. This is in Rd, by the way. We are in Zd, so this will be in Rd. These are numbers. These are vectors in Rd. So this is in Rd. And I will times dt. And I will denote this as, as the instantaneous local drift. I will denote this as phi, phi of tau x omega, because we will need that later. So phi is the instantaneous drift of my random walk, right? And I, so this is one of my assumptions. Let me put here dot. This is one of my assumptions. The other assumption I assume is that that integral of phi omega d, om, d pi omega is on omega is zero. Mind, if if you trust me that this condition that my my random walker will see the environment in a stationary way, then the drift of my random walk, the drift of my random walk, altogether averaged out over the environment will be given, given by this, inter, this, in, this integral. So this will be the overall drift of my random walk. I want that my random walk doesn't have a ballistic drift away. Right? I want that my random walk be, OK, that, that behave not ballistically, but something like diffusively or super diffusively, but not ballistically. V can be one. That's a very good question. Even if V is one, the probability, OK, uh, because that's what you want to ask, whether ellipticity holds. Yes, V can be one, but mind that, that it, you will not be stuck. You will never be stuck, right? V can be one. I will give you examples where V is. 1 and minus 1, only takes on the values 1 and minus 1. And uh, no, it will, it will not be stuck, because that's why you, why you asked it, I, I guess. Yeah, no, it will not be stuck. That's easy. That, that's due, due to this. You easily see that it can, it's easy. No, it can, can't be stuck. And of course, my main question, my main question is, is the scaling limit, long time behavior of xt, the scaling limit. Is it diffusive? Is it super diffusive? I excluded the ballisticity. I don't want it ballistic because that's too easy. But my question is whether it's, it behaves diff diffusively or super diffusively. I will give you the examples in a moment. But before doing that, if some of you are more in, in stochastic in SDEs than in random walks, in diffusions rather than in random walk, then think about the following. So the continuous diffusion analog. The diffusion analog will be the following. Take dxt equals dbt. We are in Rd now, in Rd. Plus v of xt, this is a random object, I will tell you, dt, aha, that's where v rd to rd is a vector field, a random vector field, random re vector field, which is uh, stationary, ergodic with respect to shifts right and what comes now what comes what's what and divergence free so this is just a discrete analog this condition if you think a little bit about it is a lattice version of this of this drift field being divergence free so take a stationary vector field, 
Zero mean, of course. Zero mean. Just write zero mean. Take a zero mean stationary ergodic vector field, which is almost surely divergence free, divergence free. Define this diffusion. And my question is, this diffusion will be in the long time scale, will it be diffusive? Will it be scale like square root of time, the displacement, or faster than that? Let me tell you in, adva in advance that in this particular, in these cases, subdiffusivity is not, so it's e not very difficult. When I say easy, it doesn't mean really easy, but if you are trained with these sort of things, then you can check by standard methods that it can't be subdiffusive. So it's, it's, its displacement is at least as fast as square root of time. It will be not, not trapped in, so it will not, not behave in slower, it will not scale with slower scale than square root of time. So that's the same question. Now, if you want physics, so physically, for those of you who know some physics, will, you, will, you will agree with me that this will correspond to drifting along the stream lines of an incompressible, random incompressible flow. Incompressibility is the, I, I speak to those who know a little physics. So if you have an incompressible random flow, a turbulent incompressible flow, then this type of random motion will model, in a sense, the drifting of a tagged particle, of a particle drifting along the streamlines of an incompressible flow. That's why it's physically interesting, right? Now, it has a history. Time is very short, so I simply don't have time to... It's not me who's with whom the story started. It started... Okay, if I, if I speak of this physical thing, of course, it started back in the beginning of mid 50s in the 50s, not 50th century, or the 20th century, but mathematically rigorous work started with Papa Nicolaou and Varadhan in the late 70s or maybe early 80s, and uh, on the Russian side, as Sergei Kozlov, Osada, so there are many names to be mentioned here, but I have something to add to the problem. So this will be one of my, one of my, uh, one of my, uh, of my examples, of one, one of my problems. I want to deal with. Uh, I don't give you ex concrete examples because it takes long, a lot of time. I, later I will come to concrete examples. Okay, if you want, I, I give one family of concrete examples just to have something concrete in mind. But this is just a family of examples. What I give, so there are, there's much, much more than that. Example, random walk on Manhattan lattice. Which means the following. Imagine this is, this is the map of Manhattan. No, uh, so, okay. So these are, these are the avenues, these are the streets. No roadway. And each avenue, so the mayor of, of Manhattan decided that it makes all street, every street and every, every avenue make one, line, one way. So each, av each avenue is randomly, but it makes the, the, the so, the, the mayor decided to do it not periodically, but by tossing a coin. At each single avenue, a coin was, co a coin was tossed, and it was decided by a fair coin whether that avenue be, be oriented up or uh, northbound or, or southbound, and same with the streets. Right? At each single corner, you have two ways in and two ways out. Right? And now you are a driver. It's a bit easier to drive there than in the driving in Bangalore. You're a driver, and whenever you arrive to a corner, you arrive from two possible directions, and you have two directions given to go out. You toss a coin. So this is your environment. This is Omega. Right? And now at each corner you arrive, you toss a coin, a fair coin, and decide which way out, because you have always two ways out. Which way to choose? Right? Now what, does, what happens with this driver? Will it depart diffusively, super diffusively, subdiffusively? That's my question. I give you a 15 seconds if you have intuition. If you think you have some intuition about it, then tell me. Anybody wants to vote about diffusivity or super diffusivity of this particular example? Is it diffusive? 
you say it's super diffusive. Anybody agrees? It's super diffusive, yes. One of the results will be indeed that this is super diffusive in a particular more, I will be more quantitative about that. You can do it in three dimensions. Okay, that's a spatial Manhattan. So you have three directions and you do exactly the same. And now you, the driver can choose between three, can arrive from three directions, can choose between three, thus is a three-sided coin and goes like that. How is it? How is, it, how is that? Is it diffusive or super diffusive in these three dimensions? It is symmetric, it, or, or it's symmetric in the sense that, that uh, up and down, so the, the expectation of, of, of the jumps is zero, overall expectation. What did you say? In three? No. In three, it's still super diffusive, this particular example. And in four and above, it will be diffusive. But this is just an example to, 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 appet to an appetizer example for you. Sorry? From any point, in all four directions, there'll be an edge. You can get out of the point in this particular description. There'll be an edge which is pointing outwards. Yeah, yeah because, because the probabilities of jumping outwards equal the probabilities of jumping inwards. So that's partly answers to your question. Right. So if you can arrive to that point, then you can go out. Yeah. It may be the case that, that points are isolated, but if you can arrive somewhere, then, then you, don't, you, you don't get stuck there. Good. The other example, the other example of works I want to, uh, ah, by the way, before, before going to the other example, and then I use all my six blackboards for this, for this example, is the following that, okay, I assume that it has no, I assume that it has zero uh, expectation, and there is a condition which we will understand better later, so there had been a conjecture, long-standing conjecture, conjecture, uh, which is resolved now, and that's the, one of the results I, I want to report, is that there is an H minus one condition, condition, which means something about the covariances of this guy. So it means the following, take C i j x be integral over omega of phi i omega phi j tau x omega d pi. Mind that phi is a vector. Question? Phi is a vector. Phi is an R D vector, so it has it has components one to D. And what I wrote here down, and phi is translation invariant, so what you see here is the covariance function, matrix function of, of phi. It depends only on the, if you put here, translate both by the same y, it remains the same by translation invariant. So this is the covariance of, and take, let its Fourier transform, so C hat I P be the Fourier transform of C, let me not write it down. As you learned, Fourier transform. This is, a, this, is a, this is a function of x. It's omega is integrated out. It's a function of x. Take Fourier transform in x. Right? Now, a long-standing conjecture is the following. I will use part of this blackboard that The H minus one, con ah, you don't see it now. The H minus one condition is about this C hat of P. So H minus one is due to some, so because it's some Sobolev type of thing. Can you see this? Probably I should use this. Is the following that integral on RD of C hat, say the trace, because this is a matrix. C hat P divided by P squared DP be finite. And this is an infrared bound, uh, sorry, we are on Fourier transfer on the lattice, so this will be only on minus pi pi 
to the D because we are on the lattice. So <coughs> you will not understand why, but later you will, later today you will, that if it tells, tells you something about how fast seek hat of P can, how divergent it can be at P equals zero. How divergent it can be at P is zero. It's something what we call an infrared bound. And it's related to decay of those correlations, but it's not easy, it's impossible to formulate in one-to-one -one correspondence in terms of the x, c in the x variable. So this makes the sense. So the conjecture is, was, was that if this holds, then CLT follows. Then the sense that diffusivity, then, then the work is diffusive, then the work is diffusive and central limit theorem holds. Now this was a conjecture, there were some attempts of its proof, there were, so it's notorious of being of, 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 of some, some not quite full, co sorry? The, the work is transient, I didn't say that. I didn't say that, it's not easy to see. So transience, look, transience and recurrence is related to local limit theorem. So if you want to prove transience of recurrence, you, can, you have to understand, so essentially between quotes, because it's not true mathematics, but essentially it's related to the local limit theorem. And I'm struggling with the global limit theorem for the moment, right? Good, so this is one type of random walk I'm speaking about for which I want to understand the behavior, and if I hope I will have time to arrive there, I will give you a general theorem that indeed this conjecture is true. That's a relatively new result, which will be published very soon in, in the analysis of probability. And, and I will also give you counterexamples when this does not hold, for example, in the Manhattan walk in dimensions two and three, uh, two and three, yes, when this does not hold, and then I have super diffusive behavior. Right? The conjecture is only one way, namely if this holds, then diffusive behavior and central limit theorem holds. I didn't say that if central limit theorem, that if and only if, so this is a subtle thing. Now the, the other type of works and diffusions I want to mention is, now I raise, let me start with the lower blackboards now. is random walks and diffusions where the memory comes from a different type of, of self-interaction. So self-repelling wall, this is another example, not related, though in many ways it is, but it's a different physical phenomenon I'm speaking about now. Self-repelling walks. And when I say walks, I also mean diffusions, not, not necessarily discrete time, discrete space. My time is always continuous, but sometimes always space. So I will speak, easiest to formulate is a walk, continuous time walk on ZD. In, in order to define the walk, I will need some, a couple of blackboards. Namely, I, in order to define the walk itself, I have to register, I have to record its local time, its occupation time measure. So I say let L, T, and X, T is time, X is, is a D, be some initial L, zero of X, plus So I give some initial values, which may be even negative later, but the rest is the occupation time. So the increment in, ta in t, the increment of this guy in t, the disregard the initialization, which I will need later, but the increment of LT is the local time, is the occupation time measure, right? And assume I want to define a random walk which takes keeps record of the local times, and whenever it tries to jump to a neighbor, 
it prefers to jump to that neighbor which was less occupied in the past, which has lower value of this L. This L is, re is real. Let me emphasize, not necessarily positive. Right? So I have a weight function, W, which maps R to R plus, strictly positive. And I all, this is just notation what I'm telling you now, that let me denote R of U be the odd part and S of U be the even part because these will have different roles. I will assume that the, the, the odd part is greater than or equal than some fixed gamma which is positive. This is an ellipticity condition for uh, you were looking for Shiva in the previous case. So I assume an ellipticity condition, but only for the odd part. Okay? And here I assume that this is increasing. So the even part is increasing and the odd part is strictly positive. These are, in a sense, technical. You will see why I assume in a moment. The, the ellipticity is a technical condition. This is physical. This, is inf this will be phenomenon part of the phenomenon. This is just, just uh, technical. And now I define the walk. Why do you call it ordinary? Isn't this, if you have a function, a real function, if you take the difference between the value of the function minus the value of, at the negative of the, uh, at, that's the odd part of the function, no? OK, call it as you wish. Anyway, this is an odd function of u. This is an even function of that's all it. That's all, that's all Sorry? No, no, that's what, that's all right. But what I mean that I separated W into its odd and even part because it's, it's, it's handy for me, right? And now I define the walk. Now I define the walk. The uh, probability that x t plus d t is equal to y, assuming that x t is equal to x, and assuming the whole past, let me write here ft, by ft I mean all information about the past, everything. Because it's not a Markovian process, I have to, is equal to w of lt x minus lt y dt. So I put, so it jumps along the side, uh, of course, assuming x and y are neighbors. It only jumps to neighbors, but among the neighbors, what does it do? It, the random walker looks at the gradient of the local time, gradient along the edge, and puts the gradient inside this w and weights according to w on the gradient. Since W is an increasing, not W, but the odd part of W is an increasing function, if W itself is increasing, it follows easily that the odd part is increasing. So since W is an increasing function, uh, this will define a self-repellence. It defines a self-repellence because, you see, it's, it's a negative gradient there. So if you have to choose between your neighbors, you will choose that one which has lower value of, y, of L. Right? So it's a self-repellence, a mechanism of self-repellence, self-avoidance. It pushes your particle away from places visited in, much visited in the past. Right? And, and the question is, of, again, the same. Under natural conditions, I, have, I would have to be somewhat more specific, but under natural conditions on this L, the L will be random later. See, say L is identically zero. If L is identical zero, then indeed the local time pushes it. And by simple symmetry, you will see that the expected value of L of X will be zero. It doesn't make difference between between directions. Question? Why can't you just take Because then my result would be totally different, not the same. But I, so why in my so this is a type of walk where the 
walk and you will see a diffusion process is pushed by the gradient of its local time. So that's the physics. I do have results back in the 90s with what you say, but those are different. And, and uh, physically, this is interesting. Yeah? So the gradient matters. That's OK, because that's the physics I want to understand. Good. You are right that that one would define, would define a self-repellent mechanism. If W was exponential, say, then the two are the same. If W was an exponential function, then the two would be the same by, by very simple computation. Right. Good. Uh, so x is, trust me, in, under natural condition, x has zero mean global mean. So again, I ask about the diffusivity. Does it go away faster? Again, of course, you have a feeling that it can't be slower than diffusive because there is a pushing in it, push away. So it must be at least diffusive, and that's not difficult to see. But when is it diffusive? When is it super diffusive? When is it sub uh, When uh, And that's it, right? OK, now a continuous version because I will speak mostly, in this case, I will speak most about the continuous version. Continuous space in Rd, I define a very similar thing in Rd, and I will speak that has a name, Brownian self-repelling Brownian polymer. I take a process x maps to xt in Rd now. Can you see this? in the back, back row, so that, but I, I use the other chalk. Right? I record its occupation time measure. Now it's in continuous space, so it's not that simple that I just take it at sites. I have to take it at sets, let's say open sets. So I say L T of A, where A is say an open set. It could be a measurable set. Say it's an open set. A is an open set of RD. The LT of 0, uh, sorry, L0 of A plus the time spent up to T in A. Assume A is a smooth, has smooth boundaries, a nice set. Anyway, it will generate all. A's will generate the whole measurable structure, me me all measurable sets. Yeah? I'm still not ready to define my walk because here it's continuous space, so caution is needed because local time is a very irregular object, even in one dimension. Right? I will need a function V. This is not the same as previously v it was a fixed function, which is an approximate delta. I will not write down what I mean by approximate delta. A function which is infinitely differentiable, decays sufficiently fast, say exponentially fast. You may even assume rotational symmetry, infinite differentiability, I said, and it behaves like a delta. So a typical example, example, let Vx be e to the minus x squared, or some con with some constants. So something of like that, right? And now I'm ready to define my, my uh, not only, no, I need one more. I was about to forget a very important thing. Assume that the Fourier transform, as you see, Fourier transform plays always important real role in my, in my games that the Fourier transform is non-negative. This is a very important assumption. It's a mystery. It will be some mystery there, but, but this is an important assumption. So namely, what, what, what is, this is equal to, equivalent to it, that V is convolution of two functions, to, I mean, square, convolution square of something like that. Right? Anyway, so this is important. And now I'm ready to formulate my, my, so I say dxt be equal to dbt plus, probably minus, not plus, minus, minus, now do the following. 
take the gradient, take convolve, let some space here. Convolve V with the local time. It makes sense. The local time is a measure, is not a probability measure, is a is a sigma additive measure, sigma finite measure. Convolve it with this, smooth it out. Make a smooth object from your occupation time measure. Take the gradient of this. This will be a smooth function, a, a scalar. Take the gradient of that. At, this is at time t. I put here a dot because convolution means convolution of this guy with the space coordinate of that guy. Take gradient of that. Take it at the actual position. Looks very complicated, but it's a very simple thing. What dt. What does this mean? That my random motion, so what is that? Occupation time measure, but it's, it's very singular. I have to smooth it out. Smooth it locally. It's a local, a local uh, regularization of the, of the occupation. Locally, I regularize the occupation time measure. Take the gradient. That's like taking the, the occupation time, just I'm not able to take the occupation time because it doesn't have a gradient. And the push is in the negative gradient direction. It's very similar to this. Very similar to that. So this is, again, this has some history. And this is what I call self-repellent Brownian polymer. Or self-repelling Brownian polymer. No, I didn't give the name. And it's interesting, this story came up very parallel in physics and, and mathematics and, and probability literature. The random walk story came up in physics literature and in, in the 80s, early 80s, and it was called self true self-avoiding random walk for some reason, which is not a good name, but that's how it was named. And the question was, indeed, it's asymptotic behavior a long time. And sometime later, but much, much later, about five years later, in the, met in the probability literature, without any knowledge of the physics, because these guys don't know physics and don't follow what's going on in physics, like uh, Rick Duret and... Uh, there are many names I'm not going to tell you now. Started to, 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 to speak about objects that it's not in this clear name, in these clear terms as I speak now, but, but to, and they proved some very soft results actually. So what I'm going to speak now about is not far, they were far not there. So, but anyway, people wanted to understand how self-interaction, pathwise self-interaction influences long time behavior. Question? If you study this exactly this one with, with the opposite sign, then you will stick to a region and start to build up local time there. And stick. I'm not sure how, how in continuum it will behave. If you do it on the lattice with opposite sign, then it will stick probably either to one point or to a pair of points or something like that. But in continuum also, that's what, what you expect. There are I'm not doing that thing, but there are people doing that type of thing. Now I change blackboards. And I give you some of the conjectures related to this problem. Conjectures by conjectures, what I mean by conjectures, so let me say that here mathematics was much far beyond the physics. Because, because in physics people come with intuition, with scaling arguments, with very, 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 very sophisticated but not mathematically rigorous arguments. These are, these are deep things, deep thoughts, just it's very difficult to make them really rigorous mathematics. Now the mathematicians, I named only Rick Duret, but it was Norris, it was Roger Williams, it was, uh, not Roger, it was David Williams, Rogers, so big names in stochastic analysis have papers back in the 90s related to this thing, but they asked one-dimensional questions mostly about whether it's low large number holds, what I ask is much finer thing, it's, it's about. Some conjectures. By conjecture, I mean results between quotes in the physics literature. Mostly, I can tell names, da uh, Daniel Amit, 
George of Parisi, so figures like this wrote papers in, in the 80s about that. Uh, they didn't call their things conjecture, they called them results, but these are conjectures. <laughs> that in dimension one, in dimension one, they expect that xt behaves like, do you want to make a guess? Some power, some. When I say that, I mean how does it scale? Anybody want, wants to make a guess? Sorry? I don't no, 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 no. That would be ballistic. That's too much. <laughs> Two thirds. Two thirds. People, now these days, this is not, okay, you expect that because if not one half, then two thirds. There's no other number between. <laughs> right? Indeed. So the end, the limit is non Gaussian. Strange limit. Limit. They don't say anything about the limit, but clearly. So these are the renormalization group arguments they use. In dimension two, they expect xt be slightly super diffusive with some log power to some power, controversial what power to put there in two dimensions and Gaussian limit, right? And in dimension three and more, of course, diffusive limit. And the arguments, if you look at various our physics arguments, these are really clever things. It's scaling and renormalization, clever things, but far from rigorous. And that way you will never be able to, to prove rigorously what they proposed, but nevertheless, it was guessed. This was back in the 80s, early 80s. Say, this is a good date, certainly not later than that. Good? Now, some results, some results, My first paper in this context was in 1995 when I proved actually this, not quite, not exactly for this. As I told you, there are here, there are variants of the model. Lattice and continuum, and you have some freedom to define self-repellence according to local time on sites or according to local time on edges. And it makes, physically, it's no much difference, but combinatorially, yes. So whether, whichever you can prove, it's, it matters which particular model you, you take. So for a walk model, so self-repelling walk, self-repelling random walk with edge repulsion, edge repulsion on Z, I had a paper in, that's in, that, that's, okay, that's the paper which made some influence. Uh, indeed, I proved xn by n to the two thirds converges in distribution to something, and I characterized that something which is indeed nothing you learned about in classical probability. It's not something like a stable, like an infinitely divisible or anything like that. It's a very strange object which is built up in terms of Brownian motion I constructed it, but it's very much deeply embedded there. Yes, question? What is the repulsion on Z? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean that you define, you can guess yourself actually what. So count rather than local time spent on sites. I do it in discrete time, and rather than number of visits to sites, you, are, you ask about number of crossings of this edge and that edge, and you jump with this low, but according to the... Uh, so it's again a sort of gradient thing, because you count number of crossings, differ, difference. So you jump according to the difference of number of crossings of this edge, a number of crossings. So gradient of the local time on edges rather than size. If you are familiar with local time stuff, you would think that, okay, it's the same. But there is a difference for which I can't prove it for, for, for the site case, but I... Think of this as sort of a 
It's a negatively reinforced random walk, exactly. It's a negatively reinforced random walk, but you have to be very clear what you mean by a negatively reinforced, because you don't go down linearly, of course. Yes, it's a negative. So this is characterized. It's a very distribution, which decays like e to the minus x to the 3 halves at infinity, or something like that, if I'm not mistaken. So it's a strange behavior. I spent a couple of years of my life trying to prove that it has so far. I'm sure it has, but I was not able to, to make a very, very direct link with Tracy with them. <laughs> See, no, it doesn't. The role of W will come. This is an invariance principle. W will come with, through a number. Only a number remains from W, which, which like in central limit theorem, only a variance remains from. So a number which you can, ex in my paper, if you look, I can tell you later, you can explicitly read off from W. Now later, in, uh, later with, with Wendell and Werner, we constructed the limiting process. You mean this is one dimensional margin. Now think about the walk scale time and scale space like time to the two-thirds, you have a process. We were not, ab we were not able to constant. Actually, the multidimensional marginals from my paper with much more work, but it follows. From the method of my, I proved only one dimensional marginal, but with much more work, you could, you, I could have had multidimensional marginals. But we never had tightness, and we, but we constructed the limiting object, the limiting process. So we constructed T xt, which we call the two self-repelling motion. And just let me tell you that this is the paper where all construction, which is today called Brownian web by others, is there in that paper. So it was much before Chuck Newman and others started to, 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 to do that. They re rediscovered somehow and wrote a number of papers about, about the Brownian web. But this construction goes through an inverse procedure. First, we construct the local time process altogether of this object from the ideas of that paper, the total local time, not only local time at one space and time, the process depending on three variables, time, space, and initial height. So it's a complex thing. And that's actually a Brownian web. And from that Brownian web backwards, we constructed the process. OK, so this is 1D. In 2D, OK, but, but let me emphasize that this is the beginning of the road, because we call for, for a particular example, I was able to prove the limit theorem. We were able to construct the limiting process, which we claim and we, we are sure about this is a universal object. So for many more processes of this kind, you could expect that. But that's out there. So, so a universality is not done. I will tell you more. There is something more done more recently, but not a universality of this result. In, so that's the one dimension. I tell right now, robust. So this is, let me say this is not robust result because it relies on some particular combinatorial feature of the, of the work. A robust result, robust results still in 1D is a paper I have with Pierre Tares, myself, and Benedek Valko in 1912, where we do the following. Take this, the continuous. Question? So 1912. It's 2012, right? And. Uh, Take the continuous object that's not done for the discrete for some, again, for, for some technical reasons. And we prove super diffusive lower and upper bounds. But mind for arbitrary V. So this is in the direction of universality, right? Because in this proof, and in this proof, I use a sort of Ray Knight 
picture, but in rain night, you very much rely on locality of that on, on nearest neighbor steps and things like that. Right? Time to the probably three halves. This is not so, the lower bound is the more interesting one. Time to the five. I'm always confused with that. 10, give me a second. Just I don't have it here. Uh, give me a second. Five fourths. And expected is to be of order time to the three qu three. Give me a second. Okay, four thirds. So four thirds is between those two numbers. We are able to prove this the super diffusive lower bound. This is for free. This is not interesting. This super diffusive lower bound, but in a robust way, so essentially no matter what the interaction is, but we are not able at the moment to, to be closer to this exponent. So this is one result. Now going to two dimensions, tell me what I don't see. An, ah, there is the. I started at, slightly later. Ah, come on. <laughs> Good. In dimension two, there you see the conjecture, right? In dimension two, what we have still with Benedek Valko in 2012, but a different paper, uh, is that, ah, by the way, this take it with a grain of salt because these inequalities are proved in sense of uh, Laplace transform. So the Laplace transforms of the various uh, parts obey these inequalities. In order to invert, you need either, either a Tauberian argument or you have some slightly weaker inequality. Not weaker in the sense of the exponent, but some average, you know, some average sense. So take it with a grain of salt. In two dimension, we prove x t squared is less than t log t is greater than t log log t, and it's expected to be. t times the log t power, but I can tell you that log t power is log t to the one half. A bit refining the physics argument, I can say that the, the, that would be the good expo exponent. So it's not matching. Again, the, the upper bound is easy. Always the upper bound is easier. The upper bound is easy. We are, ha we are proud about the lower bound, which is far away from what we expect. But nevertheless, it's super diffusive, right? And nothing more is known in 2D. And in three dimensions, in three dimensions, I will, I will give you a little bit more of uh, OK, some caution is needed. Um, you see, I didn't put it as a theorem. I just gave you the result. But what are exactly the conditions? I, I will tell you in a moment. In three dimensions, we are done with this. A sen OK, I will tell you in what sense. We prove, indeed, that, that xt by square root of t converges to a non-degenerate Gaussian. Right? And a caution, uh, 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 an important thing which is needed here, mind that I always define you don't see it anymore, but might see it here. I said that let's have an initialization. 
Now, what I mean is the what I need that is the following, as we will see after the break, that I always look at at the process, the environment process as seen from the position of the Randall Walker. In this case, the occupation time measure will be environment process as seen from the Randall Walker, or the gradient of the occupation time measure, maybe. And part of this of these proofs of the later result, but of this one, these are done in a different way than these two. Part of these proofs and of this proof, an important component is that I find a station of the environment as seen by the random walker. That means that the total random walk, pro, uh, the total local time profile, or in two dimensions and one, the gradient of the local time profile as a field seen by the random walker is a Markov process in an infinite dimensional, in a function space. It's a, it's a complicated objects, a Markov process and function space. And I'm able to identify a very natural stationary measure of this object, which will be just for appetizer and for people not to run away in the break, will be the gradient of the Gaussian free field, mollified. And all the results you see at the blackboard, except the one up there, the one dimensional first results, the results you see on those three blackboards are valid in the stationary regime. That means you initialize the local time profile according to this measure, and then you start the walk. And, and in that picture, I have, I, have, uh, I have these results. Right? Good. So this is as an introduction. Let me see where, where I stand. And now I still have time before break. And uh, let's start mathematics. Five minutes. Five minutes, but I don't want to waste those five minutes. I will not speak about these all things. I will speak only about the results which came with dates 2012 and later. The environment process. I hope you still remember I started with, I, I speak about two things. This took longer time, the, the second one, but I started with random walking random environment. So in the random walking random environment, this particular one of mine, remember there was a random environment, there was that space omega and so on and so on. I define eta t b tau x t omega, so I shift the environment to, I look, I travel with the random walker, and the origin is always where the random walker is. It happens, it's, e, okay, it's easy to see that this is a Markov process on omega, that's easy. And it's not difficult to see in this particular case that under my condition of double stochasticity, this will be stationary. So pi, so stationary and ergodic, on omega pi. Remember, omega was the space which, which had the a space of the environment, and pi was the distribution of the environment. So this a priori distribution of the environment will be stationary for the time-evolved environment. That's not difficult. Let me not prove it. It's very elementary. If you know how to compute, you have to do some computation, but it follows from double stochasticity. Right? So it will be very natural for me to put myself in the Hilbert space L2 omega pi, and that's what I will do later. Actually, I always subtract the constants, orthogonal to, orthogonal to the constant, zero mean. And all the analysis which you will see later will be in this Hilbert space. We'll have some nice operators down to earth function analysis. In the self-repelling Brownian polymer, so this is the stuff here. 
I, and that's what I will do before the, in these two minutes. I will define eta. OK, just forgive me if I put t there or I put t in a bracket up there because it's the same. Right? I write tx. I define something now. Eta tx be minus gradient of v converved with lt at xt plus x. Now I give you a few seconds to digest this. You have the local time which is built up by the random walker. Convolve it locally, smooth it, it's just a smoothing. Take the gradient. I take negative, but that doesn't matter too much. And put the origin where your random walker is. So look at this field, but from the position of the random walker. So again, you have, a, you have an environment, but the environment evolves in time. It's not a fixed environment as it was there. It changes in time but according to the random walker itself, because where the random walker is, it builds up in uh, local time. Right? Now, this will be a Markov chain, a Markov process on, and now I use my one minute left to write down what is the function space. Omega will be vector fields Rd, Rd smooth, which are gradient. That means that, say, in three dimensions, the rotation is identically zero. Gradients And I define some, now unfortunately I have to do this because once I am in an infinite dimensional space, I have to do some metric, some, so I have to define some, some metric on this space. I define some semi-norms. I put here K, M, R, say. K is one to D. M is a multi-index. You will see in a moment what I mean by that. And R is positive. Uh, R is positive. Right? And I define the seminorm. It's a, OK. I tell you in plain words what I mean. I mean infinitely smooth gradient fields which increase slower than any power at infinity. Right? So supremum over x in R d of 1 plus x to the 1 over R dm omega k x i. So this is, this is Omega K M R. So take the case component of omega, which because omega is a vector, you can it can be between one and d. Take any partial derivative and take the supremum of this function divided by divided by something increasing minus. Probably a sign is wrong there. I'm a bit tired. Minus minus one over r divided by something increasing enormously slow. And this must be finite for any r. This means exactly that it increases slower than I, it can increase like power of a logarithm of the distance, but not, not, not like a power. Right? I will need, this is just a metric. It's, don't be scared of this. This just makes it a metric space and it makes me, allows me to speak about some objects defined in terms of metric. And we make a break now and continue after the break. So it's, uh, uh, ah, yes, of course, this should be.